Hi folks, Denise Howell here. And next up on triangulation, I'm joined by Kate Klonick, who's a law professor at St. John's University. We're going to talk about the billions of posts that online platforms like Facebook and Twitter attempt to moderate. Should they even be attempting to moderate them? Are they doing a good job? How are they doing the job? Are regulators equipped to make laws about how they do this job? And does anyone remember Napster? All this and more on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 382, recorded January 25th, 2019. Kate Klonick on the new governors. Hi folks, I'm Denise Howell and you're joining us for Triangulation. We're here today with Kate Klonick, who teaches law at St. John's University in Queens, New York, and has studied internet law and cognitive psychology in her academic career and is the author of a really seminal article that we're gonna go deep on um, in addition to other writing and scholarship that she's been up to on the issue of content moderation on social platforms. Kate, it's so good to have you with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. So your piece that I'm referring to is essentially called the new governors. Uh, the People Rules and Processes Governing Online Speech. And it was published uh, on April 10th of last year in the Harvard Law Review, uh, coincidentally just before <laughs> all the Cambridge Analytica uh, fallout happened. Interesting timing on that. Yeah, it's actually came out the exact day that Mark Zuckerberg testified in Congress. It was like a very felt very cosmetic because I started the project three years uh, beforehand. <laughs> and so I could have never timed it so well. <laughs> right, and the other interesting thing I, I noted about the timing of your article is it was not quite 20 years, uh, some 19 years published after this seminal book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace by Lawrence Lessig, uh, which got us all thinking at the time about the notion that code is law. And what your article, I think, followed up and punctuated for modern times is that means that coders are governors. And uh, that's at least one of the, the roles that they've taken on in the modern world anyway. And as you point out um, in another really great piece that uh, you're fleshing out, I understand you and your co-authors into um, a lengthier piece is that not only do platforms, uh, this is called Facebook versus Sullivan, uh, referring to the seminal Supreme Court case, New York Times versus Sullivan, which came up mm -hmm. with the public figure, figure doctrine. Um, this piece really uh, goes deep on the fact that not only is Facebook in particular playing the role of a governor, uh, but it is also playing the role of the publisher, the New York Times, in that case, and and that that can lead to some clashes and some um, interesting conundrums for it as it makes its content moderation decisions. Yeah, no, that's um, that's kind of where the new governor's piece has led me most recently. Um, uh, the new governor's piece kind of started. Um, you, it's great that you mention Larry Lessig's code, um, which is just, I think, one of the, it's timeless. I think I read it as part of my uh, kind of PhD reading materials. Of course, I'd read it beforehand, but I had to go back and read it. And it was just actually fascinating to me, kind of some of the big pictures and issues that he highlighted 20 years ago that have really borne out um, and kind of become, they're still salient frameworks for thinking about how the internet and society are going to interact. And so this was, um, I, I, I do like to think that um, the new governors is like an homage to like a lot of code 2.0. And yeah. uh, the, uh, the work that Larry did initially, um, I mean, also, I should also say, it, it's very kind like that you said this is seminal. I, I certainly did put it down in kind of a legal context um, for maybe the first time, but there are a lot of people that were writing about um, online speech and these platforms and how much work they were doing to govern our private rights 
and or excuse me, our public rights in a private space. Uh, Daniel Citron and Rebecca McKinnon and um, and uh, Charlton Gillespie and Jeff Rosen and things like that and Daphne Keller. Um, it's a very strange thing, I think, when how a lot of this has started to become part of the public consciousness. Uh, because Jeff Rosen wrote an entire story called Google's Gatekeepers for the New York Times Magazine in 2008 that did a lot of the history telling that I used in my in my paper. And it was just, um, it was, uh, it was, you know, it was the cover of the New York Times Magazine. And I don't think it hit because I don't think people had kind of even understood how big these platforms were going to be. It just like the norm hadn't shifted enough. And so just, I think I got, I did get kind of really lucky in the timing of this and kind of when it happened to come out. Yeah, and I want I wanted to, I think that's a really good segue into providing some historical perspective before we get into the problems of the here and now that these platforms are grappling with. I thought it would be interesting um, to sort of look back at how we got to where we are today and maybe look back from your perspective since we're talking with you here today, Kate, on what the internet looked like and how it became important to you when you first started interacting with it. I found that a lot of people who decide to pursue scholarship around the internet have a personal relationship with it, a, a feeling of affinity for it, a, a desire to protect the things that are good about it. So I just wanted to kind of get your context of, you know, what the internet meant to you when you first encountered it and uh, how it shaped your desire to go into um, writing and teaching about it. Yeah, I actually, no one ever asks me this question, but I love talking about it. So thank you for asking me this. Um, you know, I, I'm 34. I was, you know, I remember when my dad brought home, you know, uh, set up on the dining room table, our first uh, PC. I remember like typing in DOS commands. I remember just uh, getting our first internet connection and the AOL CDs uh, like everyone else. Um, for me, I'm a very social person. I think I learn a lot through um, kind of externally through having conversations with people. And I was kind of a lonely kid growing up. I think a lot of kind of really dorky kids were. And I found a lot of friends online and I was able to forge connections with people. And so for me, kind of the really amazing part of the internet was the social aspect, the ability to kind of have all of these different chats and all of these different kind of new things. And I had a live journal and I, you know, all of, you know, these kind of early interactions. Um, and so uh, for me, it was this incredible power of connection um, with people that I had, some of them with people that like, some of that connection was with people that went to my school and I never even like met. It wasn't even a particularly big school, but uh, it was, uh, you know, it was just people I got to know better because of what the internet was. And so I think I've always been fascinated by it and how it changes things. I was a this I had Friendster, I had Orkut, I had kind of all of these different services. So when Facebook came along and I was at Brown at the time, I think it was my sophomore year, and it was, uh, you know, people were talking about it. And I remember it was static pages and profiles uh, that were hyperlinks with interests. So you would list your interests and they were like, like if you wrote like Fahrenheit 451, like it would link and you could see all of the people at your school that also liked Fahrenheit 451 because it was much more almost like dating. Uh, it was like a, and like that was also stig stigmatized. Um, and there was just, there was just like an entire, I just found it endlessly fascinating. And this is a little bit my psychology background and my cognitive psychology background and my interest in like the social, how people created norms around this space that was so new. And one of my favorite stories about that time was I remember really distinctly that there was this um, woman who had taken a number of selfies as her profile picture. Um, and selfies were not a thing in 2004. In fact, it was really weird to take a picture of yourself. I don't know if you remember when selfies were like not a thing, <laughs> but yeah. like, you know, and so I remember us being like, wow, like that's kind of awkward. Don't, don't you think it's weird? She's like posting these pictures of her, like looking up at the camera and like this, po like it's obviously her arm. Like she's just, and like, and I mean, 
come on, like this is not even a thing now. But it's just like so rapid how these norms changed, how we decided that we were going to represent ourselves, the ways that we represented ourselves, the people who tried really hard, the people who didn't want to look like they were trying hard. Anyways, I just immediately saw it as a space that changed, um, that removed a lot of everyday frictions of real life and revealed something entirely new about kind of people and humanity and how they form connection. And I not, you know, not to be over like hugely grandiose about it, but it just, it fascinated me from the beginning. Yeah, I had a very, very similar um, introduction and immersion in the internet uh, when I started out too. So, so everything that you just said resonated with me. And, and uh, I wondered, I, I remember thinking back to those times and thinking how um, much promise there was that that the internet could solve so many problems of the world that it could give people empathy for uh, others that uh, you know they did not share a cultural history and affinity with uh, that it could um, you know but put people together with common interests that would have a hard time finding one another, uh, that it could expose people to other viewpoints that they might not encounter on a regular basis, that it totally opened up the world of art and culture and gave unprecedented access to those sorts of things. Now, of course, it wasn't all um, fun and games. There were parts of the internet in those days that you did not want to spend a lot of time on, you know, or maybe you did, but that's if that's what you were there for, then that was there for you too. But, you know, people hand wrung a lot more about porn then than I think they do now. I think that pornography has sort of become uh, its own little portion of the web or sorry, enormous portion of the web. But it's, <laughs> but it's like, but it's cordoned off. Yes, it's cordoned yeah. off. So um, much more concerned about, oh, we're going to stumble on something bad. But that problem seems to have been dealt with more effectively than some of the other things we're contending with today. And it, it, like I said, I think the hand wringing around it has sort of um, become uh, vastly reduced. You would, I remember specific. Um, let's talk about 4chan for a moment. You know, I mean, mm, either you yeah, were there course. and doing that, you went there voluntarily and you were participating, or you weren't and you were avoiding it and you know, maybe you didn't even know it was there. Uh, a lot of people probably didn't. Uh, but again, it was something more cordoned off. Um, there were um, certain, uh, I, I remember, you know, there were sort of internet legends of things that, oh God, you, you would, you eat, you might want to look at this or you might not because it's so awful. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. And if you never went and searched for it, then you never saw it. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to mention what they are right here. If you were around yeah. then, you know what I'm talking about. No, completely. <laughs> so um, I feel like we've moved away from a world where people were in control of where they went and what they looked at, at more. Um, and could control their own internet experience more to the world of the platforms and what the platforms serve up to them. And and therein, I think we have gotten around to uh, your studies and scholarship and observations about what it is those platforms are doing um, and how they're responding to the fact that lawmakers all of a sudden are paying attention to a couple of things that they didn't used to pay attention to. One, one of those points is uh, the notion that the platforms have to treat their users fairly. And the other is the notion that they have to control their users. And it, whether, you know, we can talk about what laws are or are not in place to compel those things, but lawmakers are certainly concerned with both of them. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't know. It's funny. I'm just kind of thinking about your formulation of it, of like controlling their users. Um, as much as controlling what their users publish or what stays up from their users. Yes. I, I think that like if people stayed within the lines of what uh, the platforms want them to say, there wouldn't be any, we wouldn't think of it as controlling users. But I, I see what you're saying. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, and the, let's say controlling the users who who don't want to stay within the lines and who yes. um, want to push the boundaries of either decency or safety 
or um, other things that uh, lawmakers concern themselves with. Um, so yeah, let's so talk I, about some, go ahead. Oh, so I just think that this is like, I think this ties right into the kind of the history of the internet stuff and kind of what we were just talking about, about how mm-hmm. we both had these formative experiences in the early days of the internet. It was just such a smaller, it was just like, it was just such a smaller sample size of like the entire world than it is now. Like it just was a, like, there just weren't as many people using these services. 4chan was not a huge threat because like, just you're right, you couldn't find it. But then also like, it was kind of a thing for like trolls and like kind of teenage boys and it was really weird. And, uh, you know, it was, a you know, it was certainly like popular, but it was, you know, it was not ubiquitous. Uh, mm-hmm. And now we have some ubiquitous things that like exist so much so that they're in meat space, right? Like we talk about Facebook and YouTube and Google and Twitter um, in every type of like, everyday interaction that we have in the real world. Um, and so these things have like really kind of crossed like the um, crossed the like the the gap as it were and kind of like entered into our like into our everyday existence. Right. And that's a, a really good segue, I think, to to getting into some of the numbers that frame this discussion. Facebook, for example, has two billion something users, uh, mm-hmm. 326 million on Twitter. People post 500 million tweets per day. Uh, that breaks down to 6,000 per second and 350,000 per minute. Uh, I'm not sure where Mike Masnick uh, got this number. Maybe you know, Kate. Uh, but he has uh, alluded to the fact that Facebook reviewers are expected to moderate 5,000 pieces of content per day. And there are some 7,500 moderators. Uh, if you do the math on that, that's 37,500,000 moderations uh, per day just on the Facebook platform. For, platform. Um, then uh, Motherboard has this amazing, amazing piece that you are quoted in um, about content moderation. And in that piece, it mentions that Facebook moderators are asked to review more than 10 million potentially rule breaking posts per week. Uh, Facebook strives to do this with a less than 1% error rate uh, and to review all user reported content within 24 hours. So the job is massive. Um, Mm -hmm. And a a lot of your writing has been about how Facebook and other platforms are tackling that massive, massive job. And, And we can get into the details of that. But I guess preliminarily, I wanted to get your take on something that Mike Masnick over at TechDirt advocates. And that is, why are these platforms wading into this, what he calls impossible task at all? Why are they not putting themselves more in the situation or trying to put users more in the situation that we remember from the early web where they're more in the driver's seat um, and they get to decide what they see and what they don't see. And I guess his formulation for that would be that there would be third party, um, he wants it taken out of the platform and move more to the edges. And there would be some sort of third party, uh, whether it's a plugin or some sort of service that would control user by user, what people are seeing on these platforms. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, I I think that this is a great idea that Mike has. And I think that it kind of ties into some of the, the calls for antitrust that have been happening. Um, there's kind of three ways to kind of people talk about breaking up. And I want to say that off, you know, I don't actually think, I know this is kind of controversial, but I don't think that any of these platforms yet are, are monopolies, except with the, with the exclusion of uh, Google search, which I think would fall into the monopoly category, uh, just like kind of uh, definitionally, just because of the like, you know, they had a major um, a, ma- a major competitor try to basically push them out of the market or like take a piece of the market and like the which is Bing and Microsoft and like they just utterly failed despite like millions and millions and millions of dollars being spent to try to do it. Um, so. Okay, so putting that aside, uh, what Mike's kind of talking about is you can break up kind of like these platforms in like three different ways. You could basically take Facebook and you could split off the the things that Facebook uh, cares about, like or that Facebook owns rather, Instagram, WhatsApp. You could like make them not own those things. You could split it up geographically. Um, that doesn't seem to make sense based on how the internet 
works. Um, and the splitting off WhatsApp and Instagram doesn't seem to get at the problems that we actually have with what we see every day on Facebook, just Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. So what might kind of get that is like this idea of st- splitting off a functionality or opening up to open source or third party platforms, the possibility of being able to tailor what you see instead of it all being in the hands of something like Facebook. And I think that that's actually kind of a pretty progressive and a good idea and something that might serve Facebook really well. Counterpoint to that um, is kind of like we can talk about kind of what happened to AOL and some of we were talking earlier about kind of I said that like I would go on AOL and like chat mm-hmm. all the time. And it turned out that most people stayed on AOL and looked through uh, AOL web pages and clicked through their ads because they were doing what I was doing. They were sitting and chatting to all of their friends every evening and uh, they didn't want to as like as they're waiting for responses, they would click through. But really, they weren't going on AOL to read the content or to like be on the internet generally or to surf the web. They were doing it while doing something else. Uh, when AOL was forced to split off AIM, um, that and like kind of split this functionality off, a lot of people think that this was like the led to their downfall, basically. That like that one function was the reason that people were regularly coming to the site and they were making ad content and they were staying relevant. Um, and once these things became, you could like splinter mail from browser from from uh, chat, and they weren't a, a, a tied together functionality. It was, you know, that that was kind of where AOL um, went belly up. Um, so to speak. So as like a kind of a, mm-hmm. like an altogether platform. I I wonder if this type of intervention would cause a similar effect for Facebook. Mm-hmm. I wonder if Facebook's thought about that. And I think that this is one of the reasons that they're kind of moving so heavily in the direction of messaging and they're moving like they're trying to maintain like they're trying to create a little bit the type of environment they well like you stay on fa- you open up Facebook in a browser tab and you keep it open if you're messaging with people and if you want to like as you're messaging with people you scroll through your newsfeed and you see ads and so mm-hmm. they, these are like these are certain types of these are certain types of ways that they're trying to kind of monetize these things. I don't know what will happen if like Mike's dream kind of comes true to the platform itself. Uh, it would be interesting. It might it, it might be a different story than AOL. I it's really hard to kind of tell how these companies stay relevant. Uh, and what's generating their relevancy. Uh, it's, a lot of it seems very cultural um, and kind of moves in like these weird kind of social with these weird social dynamics um, and stuff. So it just, I don't know, It's but it's a great point. I love that that argument that he makes. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts about it. Number one is I remember experiencing something like what Mike is proposing during the 2016 election cycle. Somebody, I forget who it was, coded up a Chrome extension that would block politics from your Facebook feed. And so you could go on Facebook and have a Facebook experience of your news feed that was politics free. And <laughs> that was a beautiful, beautiful thing at that time. And, it, and then I guess that leads to my second point, which it, it wasn't perfect. Some would get through. Um, and when you extrapolate that out to what Mike is proposing here, the problems that the platforms themselves have with their resources and their staff in in accomplishing content moderation um, don't go away just because you push that problem off to a third party. I guess, you know, if what you wanted to do was block politics, it would be nice to leave that decision to the users. Um, and, and that maybe, you know, you could adopt some sort of admittedly imperfect solution that would serve the users that wanted that and and not leave that de- decision to Facebook. Um, I suppose they could, you know, in-house offer a suite of things. If you don't want to see politics, click here and try and filter that for you. But that's not really what they're <laughs> most concerned about. Um, topics of conversation, they're concerned about um, harmful conversation on the platform. And that seems to be what lawmakers are uh, concerned about as well, uh, where we get into trouble and what you've written a lot and thought about lately is um, the role of these new governors in regulating online speech when they are not the government and not subject to the first amendment. How are are they implementing um, 
First Amendment like norms on their sites uh, just because they've chosen to do so. Um, and uh, aside from, you know, what sort of speech makes it through, then we get to um, two other issues. One is uh, threats of harm, bullying, um, et cetera, things that are that are harmful to the users on the site, specific users. Um, and then finally, uh, this question of, and I guess it goes back to the speech question, uh, the governors being in the role of deciding what is truth or helping uh, users make that decision in an informed way. Um, so you have done some really interesting work and talked with people and teams at Facebook. Uh, and uh, why, why don't you give us your overview, I guess, before we go into details on how that's all going. Yeah, um, so to, to Mike's kind of point about there being, um, about this way of splitting up, I think this is also kind of leads to an interesting question that is relevant to kind of some of the stuff that you bring up, which is kind of this idea that like, well, there's harmful content and then there's like content we just don't want to see. And there's actually like, there's a, there's, there's a huge gap between those two things. The one of the things, one of the things that I think is maybe potentially long-term very bad about Mike's solution where you put this all of this control into the hands of users and this is a little bit paternalistic is that like you do does that something like that would maybe just double triple down and like the the idea of this like echo chamber effect the idea that people are just selecting in to like only hear the things that they want to hear and never hearing opposing viewpoints <clears throat> i think that i think there's something to that i think that if you long term made people just like have very um um very monolithic, kind of very curated uh, types of things that would be harmful. Um, but to a certain extent, I also think that people have always selected uh, into echo chambers. Like you didn't read magazine, like you didn't read, like if you were on the left, you didn't read magazines on the right. Like you wouldn't go to the doctor's office and pick up like, you know, you wouldn't pick up TNR. Um, it's like, and that if you like, if you know, if you were the type of person that only read like, the National Enquirer, like that was just kind of how things worked, um, and they still work that way. <laughs> and so I think that like you just kind of be reinforcing that. So those are like kind of I think the two arguments about like why this would or would not be good um, for people. the The thing that I kind of wanted to say before about the the scale and kind of some of what you were talking about is that. There used to be a way to find stuff. There used to be a way to get to things. There still is for sophisticated users. The fact is, is that there's just like everyone is now on these platforms. And a lot of people aren't sophisticated, like are not huge tech users and tech has become easier. You don't have to be like a, like a, like someone who codes or a programmer to like use a computer. That used to be how you used computers. Like then that used to be like a bar to like using, to getting online and everything else is you had to be comfortable like typing into like, Typing like loading up a doc, like a, an operating system or whatever else. Um, there's, I think that there's a lot to be said for the fact that this has become like the internet and all these platforms and these speech platforms have become ubiquitous. But I do think that it also means that people expect everything to kind of like, like regress to the mean and things to get. There's less like slowly like kind of there is becoming like less variance in the everyday experience of being on these platforms. You called like Twitter and everything else walled gardens, but I actually think like Twitter is the rare example of not a walled garden right now mm -hmm. um, because it is mostly like kind of public facing things that people are publishing to be public and to be shared publicly um, versus like Facebook, which is like, you're really publishing to a small group of people in your walled garden of like things that you want, want and expect people to see. And so I think that, I don't know, I'm kind of, there's just like a whole mess of ideas. I'm sorry for not being kind of more uh, focused, but the, but the, the idea here is that there's like these, the, the overall audience has gotten less sophisticated. The number and type of gardens has gotten more varied, but then also in the last few years, I think specifically in the last three or four years, you've seen kind of this regression to the mean of like kind of what we just absolutely don't want any more of online. And like an awareness around the fact that these platforms are progressively doing more and more to police our speech or that they always have been, we didn't know about it or have a say in it. So. Yeah, and I have like I have thoughts obviously about how I think the best way for our users to have a say in their speech policy on these platforms is, but 
we can talk about that in a second. <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about that. You uh, spoke earlier this week at the We Remember event for International Holocaust Remembrance Day and uh, said completely neutralizing speech has a lot of really negative consequences. And ultimately it pushes people further into the pools where we don't want them to be. I think that sort of echoes what you were just saying that um, a free and open exchange on these platforms is actually healthy for society and and we need to encourage that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Facebook and Twitter and other platforms get themselves backed into a corner as to what they're going to allow as speech and what they need to take down as something that is hateful or harmful or threatening. Um, so uh, that seems to be a huge controversy that they're facing internally these days and grappling with. Um, and how do you think they're doing? I mean, I think that these major platforms are taking down way more stuff than they ever used to. And I think that they're mm -hmm. like, they're erring on the side of user safety and harassment. I still think there are plenty of things that are slipping through the cracks and you'll hear them from people all the time of like, I'm getting harassed and Twitter hasn't done anything. Such and such is happening to me. They put like stalkers have posted this picture of my baby. Like, uh, how do I get this taken down? Like all these kind of like crazy stories that are really quite sad. And um, you know, and are are kind of separate from like the Alex Jones types controversies, the Daily Stormer type controversies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I think that my position is that, like, frankly, that I I think that it's to the benefit of society that all of these gardens, like these Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, stay as publish as much speech as possible because they are the the main channels through which people consume the internet and consume content. Um, but I also understand that they people just frankly don't want those to have certain types of content on them and it's not in their the business interests of these platforms to publish them. And so I think that uh, taking down something like Alex Jones on Facebook is completely fine where I what my problem becomes with like like is one when it's not when they don't enforce the policies consistently and they make kind of one-off exceptions that bothers me because we don't have that can just that just seems that just seems kind of dangerous like as a general policy about like an any type of huge publisher any type of huge kind of um, governor of having like kind of mercurial policies that aren't consistently enforced it just seems like a it's a it's a fairness and um, due process issue. Uh, the other problem that I have is the 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 response to like a general like incredible like popular outrage quickly following a lot of these really horrific events, the Pittsburgh shooting, other types of things, to uh, the Charlottesville uh, the Charlottesville um, incident with Heather Heyer or killing of Heather Heyer um, after the after the protests. Um, of deplatforming um, uh, a site that people identify as uh, instrumental in either spreading hate speech or having like been a part of the uh, violent event. Part of the violent event is slightly a different story. If you're obviously using um, these types of sites to uh, to organize and promote violence, that's like a different type of speech that I think that we can recognize doesn't have any value or low, very low, low, low value. But deplatforming, I think, does a couple of things. It pushes uh, extremists to uh, even more feel even more marginalized and makes it less likely that we're ever going to, as a society, be able to like minimize, like inter, like to like neutralize them or minimize what it is that they're doing. Two, it makes it harder for us, frankly, as like a really kind of like a realistic fact, it makes it harder for us to like monitor them and harder for the police to know what's going on and harder for us to like kind of have an idea if there's going to be more attacks happening. Uh, taking them off the internet basically means they're pushing them to the dark web means like, yeah, it's harder for them to recruit maybe and it's harder for them to kind of get their message out. But it certainly doesn't mean that they're probably going to stop acting altogether. In fact, they're probably going to get even angrier. Um, and so there's, you know, and being able to know that and being able to observe it is like really, I think, quite hugely important and being able to like get ahead of a lot of these horrible events and a lot of this stuff that's happening. Um, and then like, I just think that generally like the internet is, is like, is the world. And so, you know, it's very like there should be 
the widest range of opinions. There are like a few types of ideas that I think are so harmful as to not be worth being on the internet. But like that's very, those are very far and few between. And I think that generally um, what we're trying to do as a society is not achieved through deplatforming. Okay. Um, I think that goes to one of the points that you made in uh, the motherboard piece that I alluded to earlier. It's called the impossible job inside Facebook's struggle to moderate 2 billion uh -huh. people. And one of the points that you made there that I th think is spot on and um, part of, I guess, Facebook's problem in, in going forward is that uh, what you specifically said was there hasn't been a moment when they've had the chance to be philosophical. Uh, that They're constantly putting out fires and responding to specific situations um, instead of being able to sort of formulate policy and apply it consistently. And I think that's what you said um, just a moment ago that, that part of your problem with their approach is, uh, well, okay, so we're gonna keep, uh, we're gonna de-platform Alex Jones, but we're gonna let Donald Trump continue to do X, Y, or Z thing that would also violate our policies, but we're letting him do it because he's president and it's newsworthy. And um, we'll, we'll go more into those uh, distinctions of public figures and what's newsworthy in a moment. But but do you concur that part of the problem is that, that Facebook is it constantly finds itself in this reactionary uh, putting out fires kind of mode? Yeah, and I mean, Frankly, courts also find themselves in reactionary modes, right? Like they don't, I mean, but the thing is with courts is like they take some time and they sit and they think about things and they think about how the rule that they're applying or the way that they're interpreting a value or a, or, or a, um, or a law is going, or excuse me, the way that they're interpreting a law is going to actually reflect the values of like something like the constitution, for example. Um, and uh, I think that when Facebook started, and this is one of the things that I, I wrote about, uh, they had a couple of people, it was like a small, I call it like, I jokingly, I love them, but Judd Hoffman and Dave Wilner, who were like kind of head of this, um, who kind of worked to kind of operationalize these policies. But uh, there was a, uh, they were kind of like the redheaded stepchildren in the basement. Like no one saw content moderation as a part of the product because frankly, it just wasn't happening at enough scale to like jeopardize the product yet. Um, and uh, and so they were able to have the time and space when some of these things came up to really be, like Dave was a philosophy major. He, you know, um, and uh, Judd was a lawyer, is a lawyer. And they kind of just had time to sit and kind of think about what the values were that they wanted to protect and like what the values of Facebook were and what the values of the internet were and how they would create consistency um, across uh, with their rules and how they could create consistent rules. I think that like by and large, a lot of the rules they put in place before they left the company around 2013 are still there. They seem to be reflected in the rules that were published uh, about a year ago or a year and a half ago. Um, but there's... Uh, but yeah, I think that there's now a very hard, I think there's a tendency for a Facebook when they come up against something new to say, well, we could change the rule to this. And then people say, well, we, that just won't scale. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, none of this scales. <laughs> like, <laughs> none of it scales. No one is prepared to enforce norms on speech across tra transnationally across borders at the rate of like, as you said, 10 million like reports a week, trying to finish at each report by 24 in 24 hours. Like, there's, it's not, there is no global norm on speech. Every, there are pockets of norms, but there is no global norm. So like, what are our global values going to be? And it's just, uh, yeah, Facebook has been not super thoughtful in the last couple of years, I don't think, about really knowing what those are. They've put up this balancing test, which I think is not incorrect, which is that they say, listen, we're balancing having building community and voice and the importance of voice uh, of our users against you know, having uh, like our user safety. And, um, and I think that that is, that is in fact the balance, but it's not clear like why, like what the values are and how they are in effect going to weigh them in any given situation. Um, 
I, this is why I'm excited about kind of the, the Supreme Court of Facebook, the tribunal or council that they've started talking about creating, because I think it'll have the opportunity to be kind of hopefully really philosophical about some of these issues and create some transparency in how they're thinking about these things and how they're balancing them so that people can maybe push towards uh, having an expectation of what they what really is going to be happening on these platforms. So Facebook patting itself on the back says that there are more than 100 posts moderated correctly for each one it's currently getting wrong. Um, that seems to me like kind of a small number <laughs> for of, of all the moderations that they're doing, um, having you, oh, like you're saying one you don't wrong think out of 100, that actually adds up to a lot of wrong moderations. Um, and, and I feel like their appeals process is slim to none. Most, I can't tell you how many calls I get as a private practice attorney who operates in this arena uh, from people who call me up going, so I need to reach out to Facebook because they've really messed something up. How do we fix it? Um, and that, you know, <laughs> that's an interesting like, question to try to resolve. A copyright yeah. claim. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. No, um, I know. So, so tell us about this concept. You've written about it of the Supreme Court of Facebook and how that might help them get more things right. Yeah, so it's fascinating that that you bring that up. So, and that when I said before that like Facebook wasn't, uh, you know, when Facebook had 10 million users, uh, they simply didn't have this volume of posting and they didn't have 10 million posts that were reported every day. Like it was just a lot less. And the percentage that they got wrong had, one out of 100 had just like a lot less of a risk of blowing up into being the next uh, napalm girl or um, I don't know, like uh, what's something else that they like kind of got around the Donald Trump decision or like whatever else. When it just wasn't as, when as much wasn't happening and this was scale wasn't as big a deal, one out of 100 um, was just a lot less risky for them. Uh, the other thing that's really, I love, I always like, after the napalm girl incident, this is like something that I, you know what I'm referring to with that, but that's like the story of the terror, the terror of war photo that was like a very iconic uh, Vietnam war photo of a young girl running naked um, down a dirt street in Vietnam following a napalm attack. Uh, and it's it's very traumatic and kind of hard to look at. And uh, someone posted on their Facebook feed in uh, Norway, a famous author, and it was taken down. And then the fact that it was taken down got retweeted by the prime minister of Norway. And then like the top newspaper in Norway wrote this letter like, dear Mark Zuckerberg, don't censor us type of thing. And following that, this was kind of a turning point for Facebook. Following that, like Sheryl Sandberg is issued this statement saying, listen, we made a mistake. Uh, there, This shouldn't have been taken down. Uh, well, they didn't make a mistake. Like on the policies that they had, they enforced them correctly. What their mistake was was that they had a crappy policy, um, and it didn't take into account what people actually wanted to see. Um, and they didn't do, you know. And that was that's really, I think, um, like an important point to make because this is one of the reasons that this is so hard to get right is because it's so hard to know what people's expectations are. And as many people that are upset about um, why. Uh, the terror of war photo being taken down uh, might be the same people that like want call you and want to call up Facebook and they're like, oh my God, there's this terrible like child pornography appearing on my screen. Like you have to get rid of this. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of this is kind of the 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 position that they're in. I think that offloading, and so this is kind of I said before that I talk about how I think they can start getting this more right. It's not about putting user, about control of what you see like in users' hands necessarily. So I think that Mike's idea that you brought up before about like kind of letting users control their feed or what they see is like, that's like one way that you could do this. I think it's more about um, at the top kind of trying to figure out and let um, users uh, have a sense of accountability in the processes that they uh, are in the policy that is at the at the very at the very top of this site because right now it is just um, kind of so a few interest groups and um, a few interest groups and like people in Silicon Valley Austin uh, where you know Dublin like where the top um, content moderation and escalation teams are for. Uh, 
for Facebook. And they make the policy for the entire world. And there just needs to be kind of more accountability built in there. Right, so so what sort of structures do you think they're putting in place other than trying to just put out fires and react? Do you, do you see something promising on the horizon here? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, I've written about this. There's like uh, my, I did, um, I wrote an op-ed in, I think it was late November um, it, for the for the New York Times with my co-author, uh, Thomas Codry, who's also at Yale Law School with me, or was at Yale Law School with me. Um, and uh, this was kind of talking about this new idea, this tribunal or council that the, uh, that Facebook has um has announced that they're going to do, and they uh, made a big kind of splashy announcement. So I think it's actually going to happen. Um, but the idea would be that they create like a tribunal of people to make decisions on not only pol- big policy changes, but uh, on kind of decisions of newsworthiness um, when there is an exception for something for a poli- that goes against policy, something like the um, terror war video, something like Donald Trump, something like Alex Jones. And I think that this has a lot of benefits. Um, this is a huge benefit for, for Facebook. Right now, Facebook, as I kind of wrote about in Facebook v. Sullivan, is the executive, the legislature, the courts, and the press. And like this separates the powers. This kind of like takes the courts away. And one of the benefits of separating powers is that if you're the other branches, you can point at the court or the whatever or the tribunal and say, listen, we we're, we're we're like we're like we're this wasn't us. Like we mm-hmm. created the rule, but like this tribunal, like they like these are your people, people. This is like how you this these are representatives. They decided that this wasn't the right policy. If you're upset about this policy, don't come to us, talk to the tribunal. And I think that this is kind of I think this is brilliant. Right now it's a giant bag, like a leaking bag of liability for Facebook to like <laughs> continue making the, these decisions. It's just they're never going to get it right. You can never make everyone happy. And like this is brilliant. This is a great move. And I think it's a great move for us too. Like I think it's a great move for end users. I think that we end up getting a lot more say in like what our speech platform looks like. That's becoming kind of one of our fundamental rights, uh, you know, in this day and age. So I'm I'm really optimistic about it. And I'm, you know, I should also say that I'm I've been asked to consult to like see what it looks like, to like help them kind of plan and to to organize it. I'm not being paid, obviously, but like I, um, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that I can help make it promising and make sure that they kind of follow through on some of this stuff because I do think that there's um, a lot of potential there to finally kind of fix something that people on on the academic and like civil society side of things that have been doing this forever have been like chanting like accountability. Like I feel like every paper ends with, and there should be more accountability. And it's like, okay, well, like maybe this will actually kind of start to create that. Um, uh, we'll just have to see. Yeah, and I for one am very glad you're in the mix. Uh, so yay, that's great news for all of us <laughs> <Thank> you <laughs> listening today. Um, let's talk about your Facebook versus Sullivan piece in more detail because I find it really, really fascinating. You have hit on something that once you read it through seems really obvious that it's happening, but until I saw you formulate it, it didn't it hadn't occurred to me at all. Um, and that is, The fact that what Facebook is doing, you've already um, begun to describe how they're straddling this role as both judge and publisher uh, and enforcer of the law on the site. Um, But how their internal policies are sort of um, slouching toward emulating actual legal precedent in the United States, um, you point out that you know the folks formulating that policy, some of them have been lawyers educated in the United States. So yes, this is both their cultural and their legal background. Of course, we're gonna see some importation over of these concepts that have developed in the courts uh, that make their way into Facebook's policies. So even though, as we discussed at the outset of the show, Facebook, not a government entity, doesn't have to apply First Amendment principles, doesn't have to protect speech in the way a government actor uh, needs to under the First Amendment. They're trying to do it anyway, and they're trying to do it in ways that track the way that US courts um, have done it over the years. 
uh, they're also trying to bring in, you, you talk about um, tort law here, uh, defamation law as having a big role in how Facebook decides what stays and what goes down. Um, and this whole concept of who is a public figure on the internet having a seminal role in those decisions, as well as what's newsworthy, which is something you've talked about a bit here today. Um, so it's a lengthy article. I can't expect you to <laughs> digest the whole thing for us here, but um, give us sort of some key takeaways for, for how Facebook is trying to track uh, both defamation law and First Amendment law as it's developed in the US. Yeah, absolutely. So I should also say that, um, just I'll make a plug for it. Um, <laughs> uh, the essay is getting, was so much fun to write for the Knight First Amendment Institute. Uh, they have amazing, um, amazing stuff that they publish as part of the Emerg Emerging Threat series. Um, so I would read some of that other stuff. And then also the paper is being turned into um, a larger piece that I'm writing um, with my co-author, Thomas Codry, who I mentioned before. And we're kind of pushing for that to kind of come out, hopefully like put it into the cycle. So like hopefully be coming out soon, but it does a much bigger dive into the first amendment aspect of this and kind of doing more descriptive work of what the courts were trying to do between defamation and, um, and privacy torts. Um, in creating a public figure doctrine, and then also in the development of newsworthy doctrine. And so this ends up tying into what Facebook's done in a really key way. Um, the public figure concept in First Amendment does a little bit, does more work in the defamation context. And similarly, although it's not in defamation at all, weirdly in Facebook, public figure does most of the work in harassment and bullying. So if you make a claim, for example, that someone is harassing you or bullying you, and they've stated something that is about you and it bothers you, then Facebook has like kind of a per se rule that they'll take it down, except if you are a public figure, in which case this will stay up. And some of the justification for doing that, uh, and that was early on, I should say, that was a policy that was created like in 2000, in like 2008 and 2000 through, through 2013 and like remained. And if anything, it's slouching away from the First Amendment doctrine now, where they are actually getting rid of some of the public figure kind of concepts um, that they enforced before um, in the bu bullying and harassment context. The confusing part about Facebook um, is because this kind of first, this issue kind of flagged for me right before the 2016 election when then candidate Donald Trump had stated um, you know, a bunch of things about the Muslim ban and about banning Muslims if he was made president. And there was a, a town hall held in Menlo Park in at Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg was there. And it was because a bunch of employees were really upset because the content moderation policies of uh, Facebook said that talking about something like a Muslim ban was actually explicitly against, uh, it was hate speech and it was explicitly against the content policies. And so why wasn't Donald Trump being taken down? And one of the things that Zuckerberg, although this was like, this is not totally accurate. It was really a newsworthiness decision, but he used the word public figure. Maybe, in my opinion, getting at the idea that like public figure is a proxy for newsworthiness. But like, nevertheless, he kind of used this idea that like, well, Donald Trump is a public figure and we need to have open, robust debate on some of these ideas and political speech and yada, yada, yada. Um, these are just like straight out of the, this is straight out of um, the public figure doctrine, newsworthiness doctrine, justification for um, like that the Supreme Court uses and kind of and Brandeis and like these are like very um, very prolific concepts um, in the First Amendment and uh, and when I spoke with Dave uh, Wilner and Judd Hoffman who I mentioned before that those were similar rationales they said they wanted to keep up as much speech as possible they um, they thought that there was rationale for doing so the one thing that ha they had shied away from early in the early days of Facebook was creating an exception for newsworthiness because they thought that this was untenable. Because every a lot of things that were super super violent um, or super super um, offensive would technically be newsworthy. So ever as like as like Dave kind of once said to me, he's like every beheading is like technically newsworthy, but you don't want it in your Facebook feed. Like this is just something that we have to police and take down. Um, and the real issue for that and kind of the turning point for Facebook on newsworthiness was the Boston Marathon bombing, and there was. There were three versions of one photo. Two of the versions were did not violate the rules of Facebook on graphic violence. The other, which showed like a 
like a bone sticking out of someone's body and it was all bloody and like it was kind of, um, but it was nonetheless being published in the in news outlets and people were basically like, we have to publish this photo. People at Facebook, I should say, was like, we have to publish this photo. News outlets are publishing it. Uh, and there were a number of people at Facebook that were kind of like policy people that were like, hey, we cannot, if we don't publish a beheading in Mexico that of like a cartel leader, how are we like, why would we be publishing this bloody, like the rule is no insides on the outside. Like mm -hmm. that's the rule. And so like why, if you know, just cause it's happening in Boston, that's a crappy rule. We're a global platform. This is like, we can't make an exception just cause like, you know, you're from Boston and this is like, you're horrified by this bombing. Like there are people from Mexico that are horrified by this like cartel, like decapitation. Like this is like, you know, this is, and I think it ultimately an exception was made and the and the image stayed up. And uh, it was again, it was an exception for newsworthiness basically. And it was kind of a one off. And I think since then Facebook struggled very much. And this is like kind of from some of my reporting that I've done with talking to them, they are trying to become consistent. And it's really hard because as it turns out, newsworthiness is very much a cultural determination and very much a social norms determination. And, uh, and it switches back and forth, like how you make certain exceptions for certain types of things. And um, whether, I mean, and we just saw this with the, we just saw this with the um, the video with the um, indigenous peoples and the um, the Covington high school boys. Uh, yes. the, the narrative on that flipped, like flipped like that. I mean, were you, I mean, sometimes you can't even like, I wake up in the morning and it's like, people are like, have you heard about what's happening with this? this video that happened on the mall. And I'm like, no, I haven't heard. And by the time I like go out for a run and I get back and like the entire narrative has shifted, like more has come out. And like, there's just like, all of a sudden there's just, I, you know, all of the people that were outraged for one reason are now deleting their tweets. And like, I have no idea how to like, what to even think about what's happening. Sometimes I put myself in the position of these platforms. It's like, like, how do you, how do you react to that? Like, what if you had taken down a bunch of stuff in the first 15 minutes to three hours of this video was up and then you, you know, so I right. think that some of this stuff is like having a Supreme Court of Facebook, having a policy thing, team that can come up with these newsworthy standards, make these decisions is like a much better scenario for the world than having it just be a bunch of people in Menlo Park. Yes, depending on what video you saw and what length of video and from whose camera, et cetera, that Covington High School thing reminded me of the yellow and gold dress, blue, black dress. People saw- I love that. Yeah. Yes, they, they saw what they saw and they know what they saw until they saw something else and maybe got more context. So you talk like a, a lot, yeah. Yeah, so so Dan Kahan, who is was mm -hmm. one of like one of my kind of like mentors at Yale, but he, I mean, so you mentioned my psych cognitive psychology background, but like ultimately it has ended up being like this incredible. It sounds so irrelevant for like being an online scholar, an internet law scholar, but mm -hmm. it's actually like the most relevant training I could have possibly had because like trusting your eyes, motivated bias, all of the stuff that kind of like I've worked with Dan on and that like I continue to do research on is so relevant because exactly what you just said, like. Mm -hmm. This idea of epistemology doesn't really exist. Like no one is going to be able to be these absolute truth finders or truth seekers or truth verifiers. Um, it's all true. It's just perspective and it's just context. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not true, but like in the in the video, like there was nothing doctored in the video. It was just edited. It was just put into a different context and put into a different type of um, scenario that was misleading. And so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that some of these these issues are just like, yeah, I think it's the 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 dress is such a great example. It just gets to this like kind of how we take in information with our eyes, honestly. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I love most about your Facebook versus Sullivan piece is the fact that you drill down hard on this issue of who is a public figure in in today's day and age and what ramifications are going to come from that. And uh, that Facebook is using one status as a public figure to make determinations about bullying complaints or harassment complaints. So if you um, have some sort of public figure status and you complain to Facebook that, hey, so-and-so said something uh, nasty about me that wasn't a direct threat, but was bullying, your public figure status 
is going to uh, be trumped by their opportunity to utilize the platform for speech. And you're mm-hmm. gonna be out of luck. Um, and and I think that this is a really interesting issue. I, I've always thought, you know, who is a public figure on the internet um, is one of the most interesting conundrums that, that we face. And I've always sort of considered it um, from the standpoint of the important role that that plays in defamation claims, how hard it is to prove your defamation claim. Um, and now we see that same standard being internalized by the platforms themselves. And so, you know, those decisions are being made without even involving a court of law or a jury or the kind of due process that we, we would see in the court system. And, and one thing I find really interesting is um, what you've learned about how they determine who is a public figure for making that decision. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was like really kind of crazy when I found that out. Mm-hmm. I remember being on the call and being like, wait, what? You did what? <laughs> How did you think it was like? like um, it was like that. Ah. <laughs> um, that's a technical term. Uh, um, anyway, like, um, so no, so uh, at least in the early days, they don't do this. It's not the sole determinator determination anymore. But they used Google News. They would plug a person into Google News and see if they was. So this is incredibly circular, right? Like if you're famous on, if you're going viral on Facebook and you're a private individual and like you're going viral on Facebook or Twitter or something, and it creates a news story about you, and then they plug you, like how do you like you're not? It's not newsworthy. You're just like everywhere. You know, there's like this isn't. You know, this is kind of the the problem with doing something like this. It's incredibly. It's overly descriptive. Um, it's just about where you show up. There's no kind of normative consideration about whether we want to protect these kind of individuals or not. They make they use other things now to kind of determine um, whether uh, someone is uh, a public figure. The number of followers they have. Um, kind of. Uh, um, I think there's. They're, they've changed, um, they've kind of gotten away from using a voluntariness standard. And this is actually, and this is, I think, I'm, I like how much that you're intrigued by what creates a public figure on the internet for defamation law and other things, because like this is exactly what I was like. There seems to be this tension between this kind of First Amendment standard of de- defining public figures as um, people who, and this is the Gertz standard, right? There are like three types. Like you're either a general purpose public figure um, or you're a limited purpose public figure who's thrust themselves into a controversy or they like put in this footnote, maybe there are involuntary public figures. Unclear if an involuntary public figure gets some type of public figure kind of consideration or if they're just a private figure, like it's, they don't ever tell us. Um, and I love this idea because the internet has just eliminated all of these frictions. And now I just feel like the world is full of quote unquote involuntary public figures, people who would not be considered um, under um, under a First Amendment standard or in the First Amendment public figure or newsworthiness doctrine to have thrust themselves into any controversy. And I use the in the in the paper that we're writing, Thomas and I do this kind of uh, the, do this kind of uh, kind of rubric of moving through four case studies of like four different examples. Um, And I'm really excited about this because I actually think it adds a lot to kind of this idea of like what we define public figures as today on the internet. Um, The first one being the Alex from Target example, where you have like this person who like someone who's just bagging groceries in his job and he has a name tag on and someone takes a picture of him. It goes viral. He has 250,000 Twitter followers within like Two days and is on Ellen. Three week, three days later, literally didn't do anything. Existing in space, right? Mm-hmm. And this is like this thing that is happens to him. Uh, second example being kind of Justine Sacco or Walter Palmer. So these individuals who wrote a bad tweet, put a p- photo of them killing a lion on Facebook, and then like all of this shame and uh, and kind of public notoriety rained down on them. Third example being someone like um, there was a there's a young woman who suffers from progeria, which is a disease that makes you age uh, prematurely. She was six years old, and her mother 
created a Facebook page for her as a spokesperson for this disease. And she tragically kind of turned into this meme of people mocking her and her looks and these pictures of her. Um, and but she had like voluntarily put herself out there to be the spokesperson. But like, why does this like, does this what we want? To, is this what we want to create a higher burden for um, mm-hmm. when we're talking about public figures like this child uh, that is suffering from this disease? Um, and then we have Leslie Jones or something, which is like obviously a public figure. But we also feel like she shouldn't have to like have all this vitriol and hate and other types of speech like directed at her for no reason. Um, and so. I think this does this really nice job of kind of like those four examples do this really nice job of walking us through from like the most involuntary to like the most voluntary and then creating this new idea that I'm kind of that we we're, we're kind of putting out there called the sympathetic public figure which is just kind of like a normative backstop on public figureness in like an internet age which is just like a person who is sympathetic for whatever reason despite the fact that they are maybe like Everyone knows who they are, and we maybe want to try to curb or conscribe uh, the type of speech that happens around them. So that latter example would be more like Leslie Jones. It would be Leslie Jones. It yeah. would be uh, it'd certainly be Adelia Rose, the the young girl, um, mm-hmm. and then it might, but it might also be people who are victims of online shaming. Um, and that's kind of something that we have to kind of unpack in the article. Um, I'm not sure how I like kind of land on that. I've written a lot about shaming in the past, and I think that there's, um, I think it's, yeah, I think that it's changed a lot in the last couple of years. So I just kind of, you know, those are older examples, and I would like to kind of find something newer that would maybe uh, show how the the sites are dealing with this right now when this happens. There, there's one other thing you guys should think about as you're fleshing out this article, I think, and that is sort of the incidental public figure, that it's possible for virtually anyone using social media, uh, not intending to reach a huge audience, but just sort of incidentally going through their lives is certainly they're going to meet meet the Google News standard one way or another. They'll pop up if you're searching for a particular category of content. Um, and they're they're more public than someone who doesn't use social media. But when you look at the generation growing up today, you're going to be hard pressed not to find someone who, you know, I mean, unless they're living in societies that are specifically eschewing technology, um, people are going to have an online footprint. And and I think that that, to some degree, gets you into this problematic public figure status that can then strip you of rights that you would otherwise have under the law or under Facebook policies. So so maybe think through just sort of, you know, what living your life and using online services means as well. Oh um, yeah. I yeah. that's a that's like a I love like the incidental public figure. That's like a great um that's a great kind of way of putting it. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Like everyone has this profile now. Well, this is kind of, I mean, this is kind of what, like I didn't expect this paper to be much about, I thought it was going to be more about like Facebook, here's what you can learn from like the courts and like a constitution. And mm-hmm. uh, now as I'm writing, we're writing this the second article, um, or updating this essay, I'm really kind of drilling down in this. I'm like, oh, I really hate the idea of voluntariness. This is garbage in this day and age. Like it's not yeah. actually doing any work or it's not doing any work anymore for like the Supreme Court doctrine. And maybe this really needs to change. Um, and I, I'm, if anyone who knows me knows that like the last thing I really trouble myself with is Supreme Court doctrine. <laughs> but I think that there is, I think that this is actually this kind of really great point um, where uh, I don't know what you replace it with. Maybe directionality is kind of one of the things that I've kind of talked about. But, uh, which is kind of a little bit getting to kind of what you're saying, like incidental is the opposite of directional. Like it's just kind mm-hmm. of there's something that's like really like the harm is coming in the in the um, when someone is directing something at somebody, not in it just like incidentally happening. So right. that's a great point. It reminds me that what I'm getting at reminds me a little bit of the uh, seminal at the time, uh, Chris Anderson article about the long tail uh, mm. back at the beginning of the internet and how we were seeing that people with small audiences um, could engage with those small audiences. And yet that was an important interaction and uh, an important thing to take into account. 
uh, just as you know, traditionally we've always taken into account you know huge volumes of uh, users or viewers or engagement. That those those small volume interactions are important too. And and I sort of see the incidental public figure falling out there on the long tail, where uh, the person who comes to mind is a friend of my son's who uh, is a gamer, and uh, is is in some senses a professional gamer. He travels around, goes to tournaments and things, and has a Twitter account, tweets about gaming, tweets about where he's going to go, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no one in the world outside his circle of gamers and immediate friends, people who know him, go to school with him, et cetera, know who this kid is. But you know, he's got an online footprint. He's 16 years old, but he's got an online footprint. And and I think under, you know, current Facebook standards would be considered a public figure, might be considered a public figure under judicial standards for um, defamation purposes. And he strikes me as the kind of person where we'd want to have an acknowledgement that yeah, he's a public figure, but in this really long tail niche sort of way. So we're not going to disadvantage him. Does that sound like it makes sense? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he'd be a limited purpose public figure for kind of defamation mm -hmm. purposes, just because he's like uh, famous in this one specific context, um, mm -hmm. which he's voluntarily put himself into. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that like, you know, so that would probably, uh, that's like a little bit my my kind of, but I, yeah, no, I I mean, this is this is also one of the things that kind of we talk about in the essay, which is that the problem with a little bit of this is as how they're defining public figures and everything else, is that it's, it's not clear um, when people are famous Famous or public figures in a in within a small community. Uh, I mean, and this is I mean, this is honestly Sullivan. Uh, like, or this is you know, this is true of a lot of you know um, that you have to that you have to make different uh, that you have to kind of we conceive of uh, that type of notoriety very differently. I I love I love that example too because I think that this is um, it really also gets to the fact that there still is even though we don't feel like there is, there still is a line between meat space and cyberspace. And there, there is an ability to exist in one certain type of world um, and in the internet and then a completely different world in your day-to-day -day life. But I also want to say that that was like always true. Like, you know, there was always somebody like writing fan fiction in their basement, like every night and like publishing it under a pseudonym. Right. And like, and then also, like you know, they went every day to their job as like an accountant or whatever it is that they did. Um, and so I just I think that it's um, it's a it's a I think that the the scale of it is what's kind of shocking and fun about your your son's uh, friend. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think that it's like that people are just growing up and they understand that these are these are ways that people are going to have access to like a global audience that like no one, I mean, people weren't like globally known before. It just, the scale was never the same. Yeah. Um, one thing I found interesting in prepping for the show today is uh, Farhad Manju over at the New York Times mentioned that you had consulted with several of the lawmakers who questioned various tech luminaries who came and testified before them last year. So I think you probably have a pretty unique perspective on answering what you think the lawmakers who have been hand wringing about uh, G platforms you need to pay more attention to these issues of protecting speech and keeping people safe. And maybe we need to be more heavy handed in regulating you than we have been in the past. Um, what do you think they're likely to do going forward once we reopen the government, of course? Yeah, well, actually, I'm kind of in I'm in a unique position. There's the Data Care Act was uh, recently introduced, and I'm super excited about it. I helped work on it, but this is the this is the brainchild of my mentor Jack Bolkin and um, Jonathan Zittrain at Harvard, and uh, that is an idea that kind of brings does a nice job of threading the needle between um, giving people some protection over their data while also um, not uh, not kind of tromping all over the First Amendment. And uh, this was something that came up actually um, in Zuckerberg's hearings in April. Um, he mentioned it, so it's something that he's aware of. Uh, it's a great, 
I don't know. I love the information fiduciaries idea because I think that um, it's kind of one of the most likely to create flexibility for the long term um, without um, kind of challenging some basic problems with speech. But it's really the problem that we've struggled with in policing all of this stuff um, or having lawmakers do anything is obviously the First Amendment. This is why one of the reasons that the European Union is ahead of us and kind of uh, in legislating around this. Um, and so I think that this is kind of like a really, I'm hopeful about this, like, this particular piece of legislation. I think it has a lot of promise and um, Jack and Jonathan are doing awesome work with it. So just today, the Washington Post, I'm trying to pull up the exact headline here, has a piece about uh, elderly lawmakers and how they, um, uh, shoot, let me see if I can find it, how they, they basically blew it in 2018 in their opportunities to question various people uh, when they had them. Uh, those opportunities. Um, do you feel like the folks in Washington are as out of touch as perhaps they came across or uh, as the Washington Post is now painting them? Uh, is it as bad as we think? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> were like least politically correct answer ever that I just gave this there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, like they like, I mean, there's a few like uh, that are have have always been and continue to be um, pretty wonderful, like widen. And mm -hmm. there are some younger people that are coming in and like there are more and more people leaving tech and trying to consult. But like I testified in Congress like a year and a half ago and uh, the, the questions were, it was around the time of net neutrality and like the questions were just like, like just, I don't know, just not relevant uh, to the to the the underlying problems. And yeah, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult um, in this space to kind of read some very busy um, Congress people into, um, into a very kind of sophisticated space. And uh, I like I think that uh, it's kind of the job of all of us that do study it to help them try to get there if they ask and they ask the right people and to try to tell them more people to talk to and try to get them to get the right questions that they read uh, to the to the um, to the you know when they interviewed Zuck or when they did um, whatever else. But I don't know, there's like, there's a wide variation of the people that they're gonna talk to and they're gonna get their questions from too, right? So like, there's right. a lot of people out there that like, like don't, you know, that have opinions about tech, big tech and don't like, and they're and they're only partially informed. And uh, there are a lot of people that have opinions that are very well informed and I disagree with, but yeah. Right. So I don't know. I, I found the piece yeah. that I, I was, uh, that I stumbled across. It's it's actually from the Washington Post style section of all things. There are so many different things, how technology baffled an elderly Congress in 2018. They talk about the fact that the 115th Congress was one of the oldest in history. And then they go through some of the anecdotes from uh, testimony and the questions wanna, like, that were I don't want to be hard on them just because they're old. <laughs> like, right. I think that actually, like, I also think that, like, I do think that we have, like, a big, a, a, like, a huge problem. And I think that, like, millennials and, uh, like, uh, people um, my age and your age have, a, like, a kind of a role to bridge a gap of people who both can remember uh, newspapers being delivered and thrown into their driveway every morning and having to trump out and get it. And then like people who also like kind of did what we talked about before, but like on the early days of the internet, I think we have like a, like an arbitrage role to play there. Um, but uh, like, you know, when I, I clerked for a federal circuit judge and he read all of his cases on his iPad and he was, you know, in his seventies, he read all of his cases on his iPad. He like made notations. We were a completely paperless office. Uh, he was completely up to date on like all of, all of like the newest things and he was very with it. And I think that, so this isn't like beyond the comprehension of Congress just because it's old. It's just really about wanting to do it and prioritizing it. And I, and I appreciate your wanting to get, cut them a break on being able to understand things. My back of the napkin calculation before we started the show today is we're about 20 years apart, you and I, and we've oh, been really? able to. <laughs> I don't we've feel been that able way. to. We've been able to have you know a conversation where we understood each other. Uh, but you're finding too, just even in the law school classes, that you 
teach that you're finding that they don't have some context for the internet that you and I share. Uh, you had a tweet this, it was just this week, uh, January 16th, wow. you tweeted, yeah. me starting internet law class with a joke. Guys, the last time this course was taught here, the cutting edge case was Napster. Blank stares, you horrified, wait, do you know what Napster is? <laughs> and they sheepishly shook their heads. And your response, I'm only 34 and I can't already be that professor. But apparently that's the case. Do you really feel like your your class just glazed over when you mentioned Napster? Oh, completely. And I was <laughs> totally horrified. Like, and I was just was kind of, I mean, uh, yeah, I just don't feel like I'm like I feel pretty with it. Like, and I just, <laughs> and I was like, I felt awful. Like, I was like, oh Jesus. I mean, like some of it I understood. Like the next week, I taught Ralph Nader versus um, General Motors in my info privacy class, and I was like, hey, do you guys remember Ralph Nader? They're like, no. No, no. I'm like, come on, the 90s, like every political, like presidential campaign, like, we're like, oh man, okay, never mind. Um, I had to tell, I said, I, I did say in internet law class, I was talking about um, a rape in cyberspace, which was uh, like a kind of like a very like uh, prolific uh, se- um, essay um, in the village voice. And I was like, the, now I'm just kind of dropping. I'm like the village voice. That was a paper, a real paper printed on paper that used to be published <laughs> in the East Village. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> like, <and I> just, <laughs> like, uh, so like, I'm just kind of preempting it now. <laughs> Yes, that's that's probably a good strategy. I, uh, with much trepidation, asked my teenager if he knew what Napster was, and he impressed me. He said, "Yeah, it had something to do with illegally downloading music, right?" And I'm like, "Yay! I've done my job." (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of like how my parents like made me like watch like Bing Crosby movies or something. It's just like Mm -hmm. I, you know, so I uh, maybe I'm like the only person my age that could sing you like the Andrew Sisters songs, but I'm not I'm not particularly proud of that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we had to have the whole conversation though about um, what downloading music was versus streaming. And well, where did you download it from? Like, wh- how did the music even get on the internet? And then we got into DRM and the DMCA and how you could rip CDs, but not DVDs and why there was a distinction. It was a good teachable moment. Yeah, so, I mean, this ended up being a good teachable moment too, because it was actually in yeah. like the technological primer of the class. And so peer to peer sharing like made a lot of sense when you're explaining packets and servers and kind of how things were communicating and computer networks. So, yeah, but it's uh, the streaming stuff is, I like it's just, it's funny. I, have you seen the video of the, the kids who giving, getting four minutes to these teenagers getting four minutes to try to dial a rotary phone? <laughs> yes, I've and seen they that. just it's they hilarious. dial the whole number with the with the receiver on the top, and then like at the <laughs> end, they're like, "How do you press send? How do you press send?" <laughs> and like they like, I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like Jesus, <laughs> but yeah. Right. So yeah, so I think our our lawmakers might be able to dial a phone, but but uh, probably still don't know what Napster was or don't remember vaguely recollect and and its significance to um, everything that we uh, deal with today. So uh, it's been really, really wonderful chatting with you, Kate. I have so enjoyed our conversation. Um, it, just to, to take us out, um, I wonder if you could kind of gaze into your crystal ball. Uh, you mentioned a piece of legislation, give us the full name of it again that's been proposed and that Congress will take up as far as um, data privacy goes. Yeah, it's called that. I believe it's called the Data Care Act. I think that that was the mm-hmm. final name they settled on. Um, and yeah, mm-hmm. it got introduced uh, at the end of last year and we'll see what happens. I hear, I hear that the furlough might be ending. So like, we'll see, mm-hmm. we'll see what goes, what happens. Um, but yeah, I guess if I was to gaze into my crystal ball, I would say, and I'm always like, I, I'm like maybe foolishly optimistic. I know I always like kind of say this, but I kind of find if I'm not optimistic, then I would would could like would never do this job because uh, it'd be too mm-hmm. depressing. Um, but I I think that um I think that there is going to be I think that there's a lot of norm shifting happening right now. I think people are more aware of what's going on, more aware of like changes that they're going to have to make to themselves in order in how they consume content and like what they expect to see and what they want to see. And I, I think that there's still going to be a lot of bumps in the road, but uh, the platforms are, I think, starting to listen. And I just that we have to kind of as consumers and users and advocates kind of keep the pressure on and like make sure that these um, that we end up kind of creating um, some 
some standards that are uh, great for the long term in terms of like global speech and um, access to information. Yeah, I, I think I'm optimistic as well. Uh, I read um, an article about a Pew study that was done that surveyed people on on Facebook engagement, which um, had gone down if you believe that study uh, in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, there it is. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, in that buried in there, one of the things they asked people was whether they had updated their privacy settings and over uh, 54% of them, over half of them had. Um, so I do think that there's uh, an awareness uh, of the uh, being a good internet citizen and what that means and being um, responsible for yourself, taking care of yourself online. Um, and and that people are starting to, uh, you were talking about sophisticated users, users versus non-sophisticated users. I feel like folks in general, maybe the sophistication level is rising. Um, and that that's a good thing. Uh, there was another discussion here on our network earlier this week about the whole um, uh, tenure challenge and the speculation that um, perhaps uh, this was some kind of, even if it wasn't, uh, but it could have been some kind of manipulation to get people to post side by side photos of themselves that were 10 years apart and uh, help, you know, the information can be very valuable to help some algorithm learn how to recognize uh, what someone looks like when they've aged. And if you're putting data out there that, that you need to be conscious that even if it's some fun uh, interaction where people are just engaging with you and telling you how great you look after 10 years. Um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> That something uh, more could be done with the data and at least some thought should be given to that, whether there's any sort of nefarious purpose to the origins of the exercise or not. Uh, did you post a 10 year challenge of yourself or no? No, I don't. Like, I didn't do that. Like, I don't do a lot of the, I don't do a lot of like the memes uh, generally. Like, um, but I actually, I love the example to this effect about fake news, which was like after 2016 election, I was in all of these kind of, I was like, luckily, like kind of I was working on this area and so people were interested um, to talk to me about like kind of some of these, the things about fake news and what platforms could do. And I was in all of these kind of <clears throat> bizarro meetings um, that were being hastily put together at these top schools that were kind of like like closed door and with like the editors of the New York Times and editor like the council at Washington Post and all of these types of things. And like this problem of fake news and what is the problem and how do we get around it? And how do we deal with it from like a technological st standpoint and everything else? And I remember kind of sitting there and being like, this is just like, this is like we cannot solve this problem of like this epistemological problem if we really get down to it. Like all people have to do is become more skeptical that education is like a terrible thing to just kind of throw out as a solution to things. But what I suspected would happen and what has ultimately happened is kind of actually the kind of the like the public fervor around uh, fake news and the fear of fake news and like all of the kind of like the like the attention that it got in the press, even though I don't think that we've come up with any it's, it's like substantial change to policy online or otherwise just to combat fake news. Um, it was like a public service announcement and people all of a sudden changed like how they consumed news and people would shame people or like call out people in like their comments about posting fake a fake news link and there was like all of this kind of stuff that happened and like the idea that you couldn't trust your eyes the fact that this whole like this whole this is like you know how quickly the Covington mm -hmm. boys example kind of played out i think is a testimony to this frankly is that people realize that they're that like even when they see an edited video that maybe that's not all there was to see um, and, and and things like that and so I think that I actually think that we're like that's a pretty sophisticated, quick reaction globally for all of us on like getting better at interpreting what what we see in front of our faces, and uh, you know that being our own responsibility and not something that like platforms can give us some information to help us with that, but like that this is something that we as a society have to deal with. Right, I, I really like how you framed that, and and I love the fact that you've worked a lot with Jack Balkan over the years. He's someone I remember from when I first got on the internet. He was one of the original bloggers, and one of the original folks out there saying, you know, back in the day, it wasn't whether the news was fake; it was whether you should accept the news as handed down from 
uh, the Uber mentions of news, right? <laughs> the, the, the networks and and the newsrooms and were they infallible or not? And I think we all used to consider them uh, somewhat that way until uh, there was a, vo- a cadre of people like Jack who were on the internet saying, yeah, no, the nuance of that isn't quite right. Let me explain that to you. <laughs> and as a constitutional law professor of great renown, um, this yeah. is really how you how you should be thinking about this. And, and uh, it was so great um, to have his perspective in the mix. And, and I think, you know, that sort of the beginning of of thinking about questioning the news and and coming to conclusions that are um, uh, well thought out and well researched and are not just your knee jerk reaction to whether the dress is white and gold or black and blue. <laughs> so totally, uh, yeah, yeah. Kate Klonick, so wonderful to have you with us here today on Triangulation. I really appreciate your time and I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so I much. I had such a great time, Denise. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Triangulation. Uh, We will see you next time here on the Twit Network. Thank you so much. Take care.